Hi, I'm Danny Farentino, Director of Programming at WTAG. I'm the moderator for today's Elder Care Program, presented by the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging and the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. I'd like to introduce Sheriff Lou Evangelitis, who will be leading the Pledge of Allegiance. Hello, everyone. I'm Worcester County Sheriff Lou Evangelitis. At this time, I would ask you to please join with me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now, we have Lois Dwyra performing the National Anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Moses Dixon of the Central Mass Agency on Aging, who has some opening remarks on the Elder Care Program. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Moses Dixon, the Executive Director and CEO for the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging. Welcome to Elder Care 2021. Over the next hour and a half, we will be featuring senior-related presentations, messages, and resources. We'll be covering everything from COVID-19 vaccines to mental health and well-being for older adults. We are excited to share this important information and hope you gain valuable insight from this program. The Elder Care Program will be moderated by our friends at WTAG. We will begin this program with a few messages from local officials, followed by a moment of silence honoring those we have lost to COVID-19. I hope you enjoyed this year's virtual program and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you. Our next segment will be with Sheriff Lou Evangelitis of the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. I'm Worcester County Sheriff Lou Evangelitis. I wanna welcome you to our Elder Care uh, 2021. It's a special day. I'm really honored to be a partner of this with Dr. Dixon um, and the folks at Central Mass Agency on Aging. They do a great job. This is a wonderful day for us to kind of learn a lot of education, a lot of information. I'm proud to be part of it. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Dixon himself. I know CARE One, Dr. Dixon from UMass, and many other presenters are gonna give you a lot of good information. And I'll be back too, telling you a little bit about safety issues and concerns for seniors and help we've been given the community. So look forward to being back and enjoy the day. 
If you are an elder or caregiver in Central Massachusetts looking for additional information about resources, visit the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging's website at seniorconnection.org and click on the Elder Care 2021 tab. You can also call 508-852-5539. We are pleased to welcome Secretary Elizabeth Chen of the Executive Office of Elder Affairs to share some comments for older adults in Massachusetts. Thank you for the invitation to kick off your 2021 Elder Care Summit. I am so glad that this important event continues in this virtual environment. My name is Elizabeth Chen, and I am honored to serve as the Secretary of the Commonwealth's Executive Office of Elder Affairs. We call it EOEA. EOEA's mission is to promote the independence, empowerment, and well being of older people, individuals with disabilities, and their families across our Commonwealth. We fund and oversee programs and services to support the 1.6 million older adults in the Commonwealth. We rely on our partners in the Aging Services Network, including the Central Mass Agency on Aging, other area agencies on aging that we call AAAs, the Aging Services Access Points, ASAPs, and the 350 local councils on aging. Some of the programs that EOEA oversees that you will hear more about today include the state home care program that provides supportive services to individuals so that they can stay in place and age in place at home. The senior nutrition program ensures that all people have access to healthy and well-balanced meals. The Family Caregiver Support Program, the Adult Protective Services Program, and the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program support residents and families of skilled nursing facilities and assisted living residences. Now, I know that the past 14 months have not been easy on anyone. It has been a traumatic, confining time filled with sadness and frustrations and an exercise in coping with constant change. But I also know that we will look back on these days to reflect on how we coped and to celebrate our collective resilience. Days and events like this one remind us all of the power of community. They remind us of the goodness in humanity, of people who have come together over the past year to find creative and innovative solutions for older adults in our communities. In Central Mass, we have seen years of extraordinary collaboration between the municipalities and community-based organizations. One example of this past year is that the Bellingham Council on Aging's Elder Mental Health Outreach Team is partnering with the Tri-Valley Elder Services Family Caregiver Support Program so that they can expand mental health services to family caregivers. This is a wonderful example of a partnership that connected some dots paired some resources to meet the needs of family caregivers who need additional supports because they have borne additional responsibilities due to pandemic constraints. I hope you will continue the spirit of collaboration as you think about the next 12 months when we will continue to emerge from these dark times and when we will leverage the positive adaptations forced upon us by the pandemic. I want to thank you again for inviting me to be part of the event today, and I very much hope to see you all in person next year. At this time, we'd like to welcome Congressman Jim McGovern to share his thoughts on the elder care program and the importance of supporting older populations. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak at Elder Care 2021. I especially want to thank the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging and Worcester County Sheriff Lou Evangelitis and his incredible office for organizing this important opportunity to learn about local resources and information for older adults in central Massachusetts. This is such an incredible and powerful tool for you to hear about what resources are available for you and your family right here in central Massachusetts. Look, this has been a challenging year for all of us. I know how hard it has been on my own family as we've had to adjust to not seeing each other in person on a regular basis. It's been especially hard on my mom who loves seeing her grandkids all the time. But if the last year has taught us anything, it's that we are all in this together and we all have to be there for one another. 
That's why I want to talk to you just for a minute about an issue that's near and dear to my heart, food insecurity. The reality is that there are just too many people in our own community who struggle with access to food. Sadly, things have only gotten worse since the beginning of the pandemic. In fact, food insecurity in Massachusetts has doubled during the pandemic, turning what was already a major problem into an all out crisis. I want you to know that there are resources available if you know someone who is struggling with hunger. I've been very involved in supporting a program called Meals on Wheels, which helps to deliver fresh, healthy, home-cooked meals to your doorstep. There are also programs like SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is our nation's premier anti-hunger program and helps provide money for families who are struggling to spend on their groceries. Many of these programs have been boosted by legislation passed by Congress during the pandemic, including the American Rescue Plan, which we just recently passed. I want you to know my office in Worcester is a resource and a tool that's here to help. If you or anyone you know needs help, uh, whether it's on the issue of hunger or any other issue, please tell them to call us at 508-831-7356. And we can help you determine and apply for any programs you might be eligible for. Again, the number from my office is 508-831-7356. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. And I look forward to seeing all of you in person very, very soon. All the best. We will now have a moment of silence for those lost to COVID-19, led by Judy Shute, President of the Board of Directors of the Central Mass Agency on Aging. Hello, I'm Judy Shute, and I am the president of the Board of Directors for Central Mass Area Agency on Aging. I'd like to ask that we take 15 seconds of silence to remember those who have passed due to the coronavirus. Thank you. My name is Sarah McGee. I'm the clinical chief for the Division of Geriatric Medicine at UMass Memorial Medical Center. Thank you for having UMass Memorial participate in this great event. Annually, UMass Memorial supports elder care and our community as caring for our seniors and keeping our community well is our priority. At UMass Memorial Medical Center, the Geriatric Medicine Outpatient Clinic on the Memorial Campus is one of the few specialized clinics of its kind in central Massachusetts. We care for patients 70 years of age and older. Our experienced fellowship trained geriatricians and geriatric nurse practitioners have the expertise to treat the complex issues that often accompany aging, such as falls, polypharmacy, dementia, and multiple chronic diseases. Additionally, our clinicians provide care across the continuum in skilled nursing facilities, long-term care facilities, and in the home. We work closely with our many partners in the community, including Elder Services, and multiple home health and hospice agencies to provide the very best care for our patients. Our providers have been actively involved with the care of many older adults with COVID-19 infection in several of the community nursing facilities as well as in community settings. The division has also been involved and led the Central Mass effort in a national initiative in the fight against COVID-19. The National Nursing Home COVID-19 Action Network, which is supported by the Federal Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in collaboration with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and Project ECHO. The division has been strongly encouraging COVID vaccination for all older adults and working with the medical center to provide COVID vaccination for our homebound older adults. To learn more about UMass Memorial Medical Center, please visit our website at www.umassmemorial.org. We'd like to introduce Dr. Eric Dixon of UMass Memorial Healthcare, who will be discussing truths and myths about COVID-19 for seniors. Hello everyone, my name is Eric Dixon and I'm the President and CEO of UMass Memorial Healthcare. I've been getting a lot of questions lately about the COVID-19 vaccine and I thought that it would be helpful to you if I answered some of those questions. Now I have to warn you, most of these questions came from my 84-year-old mother. First question she asks, 
should I be getting the vaccine at my age? And I say, absolutely, mom. If you're over the age of 65, you are eligible for the COVID vaccine and you should definitely get it. And it will make a real difference. Our employees at UMass Memorial Healthcare have almost all received the vaccine and we've seen a reduction in COVID cases across our caregivers of 95%. And that's exactly how effective the vaccine is. 95% chance that you won't get this horrible disease if you get vaccinated. So yes, you should get vaccinated. And the vaccine, does it really work? Absolutely. As I just said, a 95% reduction in the likelihood that you will get the infection. They made the vaccines fast, yes, but that hasn't at all reduce the effectiveness of them. Can the vaccine make me sick with COVID-19 is a common question. No, it cannot. The vaccine does not contain any live virus, either the Johnson & Johnson or the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. So any of those vaccines have no way of possibly giving you COVID. When and how can I get the vaccine? If you are a UMass Memorial patient, you can sign up for my chart and when you reach the appropriate age, we will send you a message that allows you to book your appointment right at one of any of our three sites. If you're not a UMass Memorial patient, you can go to the state website, mass.gov, and sign up there. What should I expect to happen when I get the vaccine? Well, I was a participant in the Pfizer phase three trial in the summer. And when I got the first dose of vaccine, I didn't feel anything. I didn't even think I got the vaccine. I thought I got the placebo. And then at the second dose, I had a little bit of muscle aches, a little bit of chills, and even a slight fever. Uh, that's what you can typically expect when you get the two doses of vaccine on the second dose. Only about 3% of the people that we vaccinated, and we vaccinated tens of thousands of people at this point, have had anything more than mild symptoms. Does the vaccine cost anything? Thankfully, it does not. Everyone that is eligible can get vaccinated for free. After getting the vaccine, do I still have to wear a mask and social distance? For now, the answer is yes. But as more and more people get vaccinated and we have less and less disease, we'll start to ease those restrictions. And people that have a vaccine card what we call an immunity passport, will be able to do more things than people that don't carry that card. Will a vaccine protect me against the new COVID-19 variants? To date, there has been no variant that is not susceptible to the protection provided by the vaccine. In fact, the more people we get vaccinated, the less likely there is gonna be a variant that emerges that is not susceptible to the vaccine. So that's why it's so important that we get as many people vaccinated as soon as possible. When will this all be over? I'm not sure it'll ever be completely over. I think coronavirus, like influenza, will be with us forever at some level. But I think we'll largely have this pandemic under control and be able to return to seeing our loved ones as we did prior to the pandemic in uh, late summer, early fall. I want to thank both Sheriff Lou Evangelitis and Dr. Moses Dixon, President and CEO of Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging, for co-sponsoring this event and for inviting me to share this important information with you. I know we are all anxious for this pandemic to be over so that we can see our friends and our family and get back to living life to the fullest. I'm confident now that the vaccines are being rolled out that we can do that very soon. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, and we'll get through this together. Take care. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Collins, and I have the privilege of serving as Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts Medical School. My colleagues and I are proud to sponsor Elder Care 2021. While we can't be together in person, we're pleased that the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging has found a way to communicate their good work while keeping everyone safe. For 50 years now, UMass Medical School has been proud to call Central Massachusetts our home. More than 3,700 of our employees live in Worcester County, with more than 1,500 of those living in the city of Worcester. The medical school partners with the city of Worcester 
and a number of organizations that serve seniors in our area, lend our expertise and resources wherever they're needed. This past year has been very difficult. While many in-person services and social activities that local seniors have come to rely on and enjoy have been curtailed during the pandemic, UMass Medical School students have stepped forward and pitched in. Many of our students have become senior buddies through the Worcester Senior Center's Buddy by Phone program. Students are paired with a local senior and check in on them at least once a week, establishing and maintaining the human connections that are so important during these times when so many of us are isolated. Our students are also reaching out virtually to older COVID-19 patients in two Worcester hospitals. These caring connections can provide comfort and an antidote to the fear and loneliness of hospitalization. There are dozens of ways, large and small, in which the medical school is working to help seniors in our area and beyond. Later this year, a new Veterans Affairs Clinic will open on our campus. Our biomedical research enterprise is more robust than ever before, providing hope of treatments and cures for countless diseases. And our commitment to training the next generation of physicians, nurses, and science scientists is resolute. UMass Medical School is committed to our seniors and looks forward to continuing to partner with the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging. Next, we have Sheriff Lou Evangelitis, who will be sharing additional thoughts on the elder care program and highlighting the importance of file of life cards. Hi, everybody. I'm Worcester County Sheriff Lou Evangelitis. I've, hopefully, I've met a lot of you over the years. It's been a great honor to be your sheriff, and believe it or not, it's been 10 years I've served as Worcester County Sheriff, and it's really a tremendous honor. And just as it is an honor to be today a partner of the Elder Care 2021 presentations that we're going to be doing and I'm very grateful to Dr. Dixon and the Agency on Aging, the Central Mass. Um, tremendous organization. They've been a tremendous partner with us, the Sheriff's Department and our Reserve Deputy Sheriff uh, Association charity and it's been special to work with them particularly during the, the COVID experience where we've done so much to help so many people and this uh, seminar today is just another example of reaching out to folks and, and letting them know we're out there for you, we care about you, and we're going to get through this, and we're getting there. Um, I want to thank the sponsors for today's program that make this possible. You're going to get a lot of great presentations today, and we're very happy to have a presentation for you as well. And I'm excited today to tell you a little bit about our Safeguarding Seniors presentation that we have on behalf of the Worcester County Sheriff's Association and Worcester County Sheriff, how we can help you. So during these times, as I mentioned, COVID-19, it's been so hard on our seniors. Isolation is not anybody really wants, and especially folks, you know, when you get a little older, you like to be out there and see your friends and, and be sociable, especially if you've got time on your hands, and it's been real challenging. But we've worked real hard with the Sheriff's Office and the Worcester County Reserve Deputy Sheriff Association to serve our seniors throughout these challenging times. We stepped up, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about things we did, but we shop for seniors. Uh, who couldn't get out of their homes, especially during the height of COVID. We distributed PPE kits. We placed U.S. flags for our veterans on Memorial Day. We had an organic farming program, which was unbelievably successful, another year of distributing organic food to the community and our annual winter coat drive. People wanted to help. So what they did is we helped certain buildings. They had centers throughout the county. Uh, we would set up with the directors of these buildings to help grocery shop for people. We did prescription pickups, we provided toilet paper, we did wellness checks on folks, and we did personal protective equipment as well. It just demonstrated the commitment we had to bring joy, to see people, to let them know we're there for them, and I'm really proud of the work we did in our shopping uh, for seniors. We also had personal protective kits put together for seniors. Our downtown office particularly, we had a lot of donations made to our charity. That allowed us to get every senior center in Worcester County personal protection equipment. That means a bag of equipment. And I'll never forget when we got the call to help put Memorial Day flags out for St. John's Cemetery in Worcester. And we had a special moment and we did it socially distant. We spread people out. We had it organized where we handed out flags to all 120 volunteers. And we put those flags out at St. John's on those veterans tombs. And I will never forget that day. That was a very special time for me personally and for our reserve deputy sheriffs and our department 
to do something like that to give back so much to those who've given so much. So we also have our annual winter coat drive and some of you may have heard about it, but we have always been able to distribute. First started when I was elected, we had a kind of a smaller coat drive of a thousand or so coats, but we soon built it up. But they were collection boxes and it's awful hard to get collections during COVID. So we were thinking, is there a way we could do it with new coats? Well, again, back to Central Mass Agency on Aging and Dr. Dixon. But Dr. Dixon came to us and he said, I have funding available to help you buy some coats for some seniors. I'd like to help you. And that kind of kicked off our winter coat drive this year. We weren't sure if we could do it. And we decided to do it in a different way. And that would be buying new coats for everybody. And thanks to the grant from the Central Mass Agency for Aging, Others came forward with donations, some as little as five or $10. We did over 4,000 winter coats, brand new. And those coats were distributed all over Worcester County. We started up in Gardner like we do every year. And we went through Fitchburg and Lemonster, right down into Worcester and Shrewsbury and down into Webster and Southbridge and everywhere in between. Where there was a need for people to have coats, we were providing them. This is something we've been doing for years. We were so happy to have this partnership with Central Mass Agency for Aging, and we were able to do so many additional coat locations, senior centers, veterans groups, homeless population, children, and food pantries. And as you can see a photograph here of our good friends down in Millbury, just another example of the Millbury Senior Center bringing in coats to help people get through this pandemic. And it's been really, again, a special part of what it means to be sheriff and be working with such special people. This has been a hard time for everyone, especially our seniors. And I know through my, my parents and my uncles and aunts and, and family and friends that, you know, we're all struggling. We're all looking forward to being together again. And I think our seniors particularly are excited about this. And we are so looking forward to getting back and seeing you all in person. I think it's coming sooner than later. Um, just be careful, be safe. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully some of this information can help you. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Worcester County Sheriff Lou Evangelitis. I'm here to talk to you about something that could actually save your life. It's the new File for Life cards, which we have right now available to everyone. It's offered by the Central Mass Agency for Aging and the Worcester County Sheriff's Department. And this is something which everyone should have. I have one on my refrigerator. What this does is safeguard your information on your critical medical information, what type of prescriptions you perhaps are on, your emergency contacts, all this information can be provided in a file for life card, which if you have on your refrigerators, first responders are trained to look for this when they get to your house in the worst case scenario where you would be unresponsive. So the information below will tell you on where to get one. These are our new file for life cards and they're new because they have an information here on your COVID vaccination information, including your first shot, your second shot, your manufacturer and any other special remarks. And if you have a COVID vaccination record, which we've all been told, these cards are gold. It's a great place to keep it, a nice secure place to put it in behind it so you'll know where it is at all times. So take advantage of these files for life. They could save your life. I'm Worcester County District Attorney Joe Early Jr. and I'm honored to speak with you today. I'm excited to work with the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging to support Elder Care 2021. Elder Care is a wonderful event, providing educational information and resources to support a prosperous and safe life. I love working with seniors. You provide invaluable wisdom and insight, and I believe that we owe you everything. Every day is a learning opportunity, no matter your age, from health to cyber safety and scams. Today is our chance to help you. Our office is committed to supporting the seniors of Central Massachusetts, and as your district attorney, I want to protect you. We are continuously researching and evolving to stay updated on current trends, threats, and resources. Throughout the past year, we have seen an increase in scams targeting seniors, people looking to separate you from your hard earned savings. From educational videos to local presentations on a variety of topics, including scams and safety, we work with the community to inform others and stay one step ahead of trouble, one step ahead of the bad guys. And our goal today and every day is to help you. We are honored to be part of Elder Care 2021 and look forward to continuing to support all seniors throughout Worcester County. As my father used to tell me, you've paid your dues. You're at a point in life where you should be able to relax, enjoy yourself in every day. Have it a good day. Thank you.
If you are an elder or caregiver in Central Massachusetts looking for additional information about resources, visit the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging's website at seniorconnection.org and click on the Elder Care 2021 tab. You can also call 508-852-5539. In the next portion of our program, Dr. Moses Dixon will be presenting on how the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging has responded to assist our region's older population and the state of older adults across Central Massachusetts. On behalf of the Board of Directors and the hardworking staff and many volunteers, I am pleased to address you about the state of our senior citizens here in Central Massachusetts. 2020 was a challenging year for all of us, especially for our senior citizens here in Central Massachusetts and across the Commonwealth and indeed across the nation. We have lost Americans to COVID-19 many of whom are older adults and people of color. Let us remember these Americans as we continue to battle this pandemic. Indeed, hope is among us with the statewide rollout of the vaccine sites in Massachusetts. But even as more and more people are getting vaccinated, it is still urgent that we all wear a mask and to continue to socially distance. I want to speak about what the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging has done to support our older adults since the start of the pandemic. First, I want to thank our partners at the state and the federal level and our local partners here in Central Massachusetts. The Aging Services Access Points and the 60 Councils on Aging and the Senior Centers. In 2020, we serviced over 9,000 people through our non-nutritional programs and became the official sponsor of the Senior Fraud Helpline for Central Massachusetts. We also partnered with Worcester State University on intergenerational engagement to tackle social isolation among our seniors during COVID-19. In 2019, 706,000 meals on wheels were delivered throughout our service area. This increased to 809,000 in 2020, representing a 14% increase in the greater Worcester area. We saw a 19% increase among Asian Americans, a 40% increase among African American, and a 28% increase among Latinos. Overall, 9,500 older adults were served through our nutritious programs in 2020. We were heavily involved in the distribution of food from the USDA's Farm to Family Food Box program to approximately 200 elders and their families. We also partnered with local food pantries to deliver food to elders as well. In 2020, we funded over 6,100 hours of legal services for 512 older adults. We awarded CARES funding to, the, to community legal aid and to the crisis interventions programs to our Aging Services Access Point partners to address the eviction crisis among our senior citizens. We completed our needs assessment in December of 2020. In addition to concerns about housing, nutrition, and mental health, we have documented the need to improve both technology and technical training for older adults. We continue to reach marginalized populations and build partnerships with organizations outside of the Elder Service Network. We are also involved with the Coalition for the Healthy Greater Worcester's Community Health Improvement Plan, also known as CHIP, which helps coordinate healthcare and human service providers operations in the Greater Worcester area. The last CHIP did not adequately address the needs of older adults we are ensuring that the next CHIP does. Finally, I would like to note that we were able to ensure that over 1,500 senior citizens had jackets and masks for the winter. Additionally, we reached over 40,000 older adults through our census outreach program. Our work is ongoing and more robust. With the support of our community partners, we look forward to continuing to be the leader in providing information and resources to older adults here in central Massachusetts. Be well and be safe and thank you. Hello, I'm Deb Davio, Vice President of Medicare and Executive Director of Navicare for Fallon Health. 
it's great to be here with you today. As Worcester's local health plan for more than 40 years, Fallon is proud to sponsor Elder Care 2021. I know how much those of you who attend this annual event take away from it. Now, more than ever, the resources you will learn about today are invaluable. And we are grateful to the organizers who found a way to continue hosting in the midst of the current healthcare crisis. This coronavirus pandemic presents challenges for all of us, personally and professionally. And I believe it's important that we support one another during this time within our communities of friends, families, neighborhoods, and businesses. We need to work together to manage the spread and tragic effects of this pandemic. This event is bringing together so many of the Central Massachusetts organizations that are working day in and day out to provide resources to benefit older adults in the area. We share the goal of improving the health and well-being of our communities. Today, you'll have a chance to learn more about how they can help you and the people you care about. At Fallon Health, our mission of making our communities healthy always guides us. Older adults are essential members of our communities, and it's become especially important to make sure they have the resources they need during the pandemic. To help in Central Mass, Fallon provided support to the Worcester Together Fund, which addresses immediate basic needs and long-term local re relief efforts and to organizations that provide help to older adults who are dealing with isolation and other issues, regardless of whether they have Fallon Health as an insurer. Our goal is to help older adults maintain their health and continue living safely in their homes and communities with access to health care, behavioral health resources, food, and utilities. To learn more about Fallon Health, give us a call at 1-877 255-7108 or visit our website, fallonhealth.org. Again, Fallon Health is proud to be part of this event and hope you value the experience as much as we do. With that, have a great event and congratulations to the organizers for all you have done to make today a success. Stay safe and be well. Our next segment will be a discussion of the pros and cons of CBD for seniors, featuring speakers from Resonate, Inc. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on, on Elder Care 2021. My name is Peter DiCaro. I'm the founder and CEO of Resonate, a local cannabis dispensary based out of Worcester. With me today is Julie Battle, an advanced practice nurse with CannaWise Alternative Medicine. And here today, we're, we're here to talk to you about how to live a healthy, happy life with cannabis. So happy to have you here today. <laughs> it's really nice to be here. So, have so it, it, and it's really exciting to be here today because the point that I'm trying to make is we came from this stigma of people saying it privately to now you and I engaging patients every day on how to use this plan to address their, their medical conditions. So let's let's talk about cannabis and, and let's talk about all of the benefits and as as to why it helps the body. So why are we here talking about this? You know, how has cannabis positively affected your patients? So it uh, definitely positively affected my patients in so many different ways. And But I think what's been the most exciting part about it is that we've realized that humans um, have an endocannabinoid system. And that is why cannabis or cannabinoid medicine works because we have a system set up for it. And I think most people don't know that. So we're talking about 1992. Yep. The medical community right. community learned about this That's endocannabinoid right. system, and I think what we have found here, as the states have rolled out regulation to support our, our mission, we have found that several debilitating conditions right. um, have been addressed. That patients are getting relief from ailments such as Alzheimer's and fibromyalgia, and you know pain pain relief from whether it's surgical at any age um, up until your later years. But I think it's also more than that. This endocannabinoid system is so exciting, right? So you're, everyone has their own unique system. And how does it work? So we talk about receptors. Can Help me understand right, that. Right, right. So it's, it's sort of like a classic lock and key mechanism where a receptor is a lock and it needs a certain key. 
and the key can be cannabis. And um, our body sees it the same as our natural chemicals and it's used to therapeutic use throughout your whole body. And I think the reason why there's so many different syndromes and things that it's helpful for is because it works in a more system approach. That it, it's more comprehensive. It's more, it's more comprehensive, it's more complex, and it's more complete. The cannabinoids and the terpenes that are in the plant, all right, let's talk about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. they're, they're responsible, right? Th That's right. For providing relief to these ailments. And, and how has CBD helped patients with those conditions? Oh, in the, in the neuropathy. A lot of the cancer studies right now are still in the set, in the cell, you know, in the test tube. And so it's not in, it's in vitro, not in vivo. And so we don't have a ton of it, but we're starting to collect it. And what this new data out of Israel shows, it's a big study that people who are forget which kind of cancer, but they're given chemo and they have neuropathy from it. De de many people have debilitating neuropathy forever afterwards. If people take cannabis um, at the same time they take the um, chemo agent, they don't develop neuropathy and it seems to be, or, or they develop more minimally and it seems to be even more protective that if people were using cannabis before the, the chemo, they didn't have neuropathy or to any extent. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It, it it's really amazing. is. Yeah. It, you know, the other that thing that amazes me about the whole process is that we have the ability to, at, at relatively low costs, for those that are survivors or those that are going through this process to find alternative ways to treat ourselves. And, and even if we can't 100% quantify the benefits right. of what's exactly in front of us, what we can say is that the studies have shown right. that this can help debilitating conditions, right? This can help Alzheimer's patients. Yep. You know, it, it doesn't mean it's going to reverse, you know, the onset. Right, right. Debilitating and minor. I mean, it, it, it's not, um, <clears throat> you don't have to have a debilitating condition to benefit from cannabis as, um, as a medicine, as a treatment for various ailments that are, that are plaguing you. So when we talk about cannabis today, there are two main cannabinoids mm -hmm. that everyone talks about. Mm -hmm. We talk about CBD, right. and we talk about THC. Right. Um, but the truth is, we're still uncovering more cannabinoids in the plant. And cannabinoids, um, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. um, are those, those, those chemicals, that, those genetics within the plant that are really addressing those receptors in the body that are responding to whatever that condition may be, correct? That's right, Th those are the keys to the locks. And we also talk about terpenes. That's right. And, and what are we learning about terpenes? So ter what we're learning about terpenes is, is manifold. I mean, a lot of it we've learned before. And generally, terpenes are more in charge of the effects that somebody feels, whether it's more sedating or more um, energy or that sort of thing. We know terpenes are in all plants and um, they, they're, they're just very impactful. And the way they work together with cannabinoids is what is called the entourage effect. And, and thank you, you segue right into my <laughs> next question, which, which is for, for all those at home that are interested in exploring this, it, it can be an intimidating subject. Yeah. We talk about CBD, we talk about THC, people are wondering whether or not it's good for them. And we're talking about the combination of the two and point out here in a slide that, that we've identified two strong combinations in a 10 to one and a four to one ratio, mm -hmm. which means that we're combining these two leading cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. And when you do that, can you talk a little bit about what it does in terms of the benefits? Sure, so, so there's really two main benefits, um, or more than that, but two specifically where you can you use less to get a better outcome, so you, you use less product. And then the other thing is that it'll lessen the side effects if you get side effects from one cannabinoid and not the other one. Using them together will decrease both the side effect and the, and the effects. To many surprise, and I, and I see this all the time when they come into the dispensary, it's, well, you're steering me towards this CBD product. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're not steering me towards this THC product. That's right. Um, and the truth is, I'm always trying to drive towards a 10 to one or a four to one product. For things like, for people that come in and they're dealing with the number one issue I find that creates so many different illnesses and ailments, inflammation. Inflammation. Right? You know, we talk about yeah. some of the benefits of CBD. We're talking about re reduction of inflammation. Right. Some anxiety relief. Definitely. Anxiety relief, pain relief. 
Um, and, we, and we believe that inflammation is the really the root cause of all, most, most if not all, of disease processes in humans. So anything that gets to that um, under level, there's a sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system that needs to balance out. There's a desired outcome of how do I feel better? Right. You know, and when it, when it comes to a debilitating condition, I think it's important to mention that there are many phases to that, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the diagnosis, the onset, the treatment, and the recovery. And the beauty of cannabis and the cannabinoids that exist within it is that you, you can use this throughout the entire process, mm -hmm. whether it's relieving your anxiety associated with the, the illness itself or treating yourself as you go through the recovery, using it to reduce your inflammation, right. helping your body to recover even further. That's the part that gets me really excited, as you can kind of tell, you know, because the outcomes are so significant. Right. You know, like the story you told me about the Alzheimer's patient that went from nonverbal to verbal. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, um, you know, we're, we're on, you know, limited time here yep. today. I know this is a yep. subject that we can talk all yep. day about, but I think it's important for our audience to know, you know, where you can go to begin to learn more and to provide, uh, to get the relief that you may be looking for. We talk about CBDs available in most stores today. Right. You'll see it in gas stations. It's prevalent. Um, but we always try to direct patients to go to a dispensary because it's regulated, because you can see the right. test results from the products that you're purchasing and get the necessary relief that you're looking for. Like most drugs or like, like you know, this is a natural and almost organic product, but um, there are side effects like we talk about with THC. But going to a dispensary, we can talk to them about mm -hmm. how to address these concerns and how to find the right vehicle for them to, to get the necessary relief that they need. That's right. Yep. Well, great. Well, listen, thank you, thank you for joining us today. This has been great. great. And thank you all at home thank for you. joining us. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Michael Welch, CEO of Unibank. It's a privilege for us to be part of Central Mass Agency on Aging. Having grown up in a multi-generational household in Worcester, I learned the importance of elders in my own life. After that, I spent 10 years on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in a society and culture where elders are central to the transmission of wisdom for the ages. Now, coupled with Unibank, our mission being serving the community, it's only natural for us to be part of our cherished asset, the elders in our community. We are grateful for the opportunity to be part of the Central Mass Agency on Aging. Hello, I'm Lamonia Miranitas, and I manage the Worcester location of Unibank, as well as the Willows location of Unibank, uh, which is housed in the Willows Retirement Community. It is open only to the residents, but it's a pleasure to work with so many of those residents that are there. We have a variety of customers all over our branch locations in, in central Massachusetts, and it's a pleasure to service them, to bond with them, to listen to the stories and to be able to personalize uh, the services that we offer. That's what's so wonderful about working for Unibank. Uh, being a community bank, we're able to focus on our customers, but it's also a pleasure to partner with nonprofits such as the Central Mass Agency on Aging in support of our seniors. We welcome the relationship and we welcome seniors to reach out to us um, because we are very understanding of what their needs are. Thank you. And at Unibank, it's not about transactions. It's about people. And it's a privilege for us to meet all of you in our local branches or in business activity. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your lives and the Central Mass Agency on Aging. We'd like to introduce you to our friends at Care One of Millbury, who will be sharing their experience about the COVID-19 vaccine. I'm Christine Bennett, the administrator at Care One at Millbury. We are so grateful to be invited by the Worcester County Sheriff's Office and the Central Mass Agency on Aging to participate in this virtual elder care event for 2021. We hope that you enjoy some stories from our residents and our employees about their experience with the COVID vaccine. Hello, my name is Melissa Ferguson. I am the Director of Nursing um, at Care One at Millbury. Um, I'm here today to tell you about my experience with getting the vaccine. I actually am not usually a person who gets vaccines. I actually have an allergy to the flu vaccine and had to stop getting that years ago. 
But with the pandemic, I felt though as though the COVID vaccine was extremely important for me as a leader to show others who were fearful of the vaccine to actually get it. And I was actually the first one in the building to receive the vaccine for everyone to see. Um, I had very minimal side effects, a little bit of tired the next day after the first um, injection, after the second injection, a little bit of achiness, a little bit of tiredness, a little headache, but within 24 hours, I was absolutely fine. So I am fully vaccinated at this point and was able to get many of the staff members to follow my lead to get vaccinated so that we could get back to some sort of a normal world in our world here in long-term care. Um, I was also part of watching the residents get the vaccination. I was here for both days that they got vaccinated and traveled with the crew who vaccinated them. Um, it was a very moving experience seeing the residents um, knowing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, um, seeing them be happy um, with tears, knowing that they would be better. Um, I actually witnessed one where the daughter was actually Skyping with her mother when she got the vaccination. The daughter was crying in the background, tears of happiness about her getting it. Every resident took a picture with us. Every resident had a thumbs up. They had minimal to absolutely no side effects from getting the vaccine. And I've been very excited about it. They went through a lot during the pandemic and are very excited about having um, this light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it was also very moving for the staff. We had several staff members who were very sick during COVID who had been in the hospital and watching them with their tears of joy and happiness get the vaccine as well was very moving. And um, I feel it's very important to get the vaccine for all of us to get vaccinated so that we can go back to a much normal life and not lose any more of our loved ones. Everybody, this is Christo Athenis. Christo was born in 1915. 14. <laughs> he would know. 106 years old. I'm 106, going to be 107. We're here today to talk about the coronavirus. You and I have spoken about your life when you were five years old, that there was a pandemic that was happening. That's right. What was that pandemic? TB. TB, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. How did tuberculosis affect yeah. your family, Christo? My mother, her two sisters, her brother who was a doctor, and my grandmother all died within a couple of years. That... And I have signs of tuberculosis, but they're not active, thank God. Yeah. So, from a very young age, you had experienced a pandemic. That's right. A health scare. Yes. Something that affected this nation. That's right. And affected you personally. Well, I thought a lot about it mm -hmm. because I was wondering if it was another case of TB. Yep. Because it was something respiratory, yes, coronavirus. It was something that was spread by droplets. And then they would die in by buckets. A few months ago, you had the opportunity to get a vaccine. Yes, I did, and I was happy. Can you tell us why it was? In and and I was happy when I was offered the vaccine. I guess it was just. The last of December, mm -hmm. I had my first shot. Mm -hmm. 14 days, 14 or 15 days later, mm -hmm. I got my second shot and I was relieved. <laughs> That's wonderful. We're relieved as well. How was getting the shot? Did it hurt? I didn't even know I had it. <laughs> So you weren't afraid of getting it no, either. No, I wanted it in the worst way, mm -hmm. even if it was going to hurt, mm -hmm. which it didn't. Yeah. Did you have any side effects after the shot that day, the next day? How did you feel? Relieved. Yes. So life for you at 106. Right. After the vaccine. 
What are you looking forward to? A happy life the rest of my days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were able to see your children for the first time in almost a year recently. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. I want to see my son in Arizona the worst way. Mm -hmm. We want you to see him in the worst way too. We have a feeling that's going to be happening fairly soon. I hope so. Yeah. What are you looking forward to being able to do here? Now that you've had the vaccine and you can feel a bit more safe. Playing bingo. <laughs> Playing bingo. How about being outside? I don't believe it. Oh, come on. It's going to happen. I, I know. hope so. Yeah, absolutely. We have a beautiful courtyard here. I know we yeah. do. Yes. And, uh, and I made down good use of it. Yes, you did. In the past. Yep. So bingo, being outdoors, visiting with your family, coming down to my office. Can I and expect I, that? Yes. Oh, good. I'm happy to hear that. A visit from you makes my day. Thank you. Thank you, Christo. People like you that are brave enough and have the courage to trust in the vaccine, to have things turn around. I couldn't be more proud. Yeah. Christo, thank you. Thank you for, yeah, yes, your honest thought about getting the vaccine and what it meant to you. And what well, it, I'm here. Yes, now. you are. <laughs> yes, you are. <coughs> we very much appreciate you taking a minute to talk with us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robbie Sestero. I'm an admissions director here at Care One Millbury. Um, before the vaccine, life was hard here for this past year. And uh, a lot of work, a lot of taking care of people. We saw a lot of sadness. Um, when the vaccine came about and available, I was excited about it. I was excited about getting it. Um, to me, it meant uh, a way out of this mess, a way out of this year um, that has been so difficult. Um, watching families that can't come and visit their, their loved ones and, and, and watching other family members suffer through this past year. This was an opportunity to be part of a solution uh, and, and to move forward. Uh, and it, was, it represented that to me. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, I got teary-eyed standing in line waiting to get my vaccine because to me it represented an open door to the, the possibility of seeing my children, my grandbabies, um, who I miss. Uh, and it's been very difficult this past year not seeing them. I didn't have a whole lot of uh, symptoms. I was able to come back after uh, the day after I had it to work. I didn't feel that great. I felt a little uh, arm soreness, which is normal. Um, I had a few body aches, but nothing to um, keep me from going back to work. Uh, I look forward to um, getting some normalcy back, not living in fear, not being fearful of just going to the store and wiping my whole uh, cart down with a uh, Lysol and, 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 and being fearful that that person coming next to me, you know, may be infected or I may be infecting that person. So to me, the shot represented maybe a little bit more freedom, maybe more peace of mind. Um, and I was really glad to get it, and I'd get it again and again if it meant that I get my life back and can see my children and my grandchildren and go out to dinner and have fun. Hi, my name is Cheryl Perry, and I'm the Director of Community Marketing, and I'm the Director of the Recreation Department here at Kia One Millbury. And I'm here today talking about the vaccine with Joanne Shepard, who is a resident here. And I have some questions that I'd like to ask you. How was life for you pre-COVID? Pre-COVID, life was wonderful here at Care One Millbury. We would do things as a group. We would go shopping at places like Kohl's or Walmart, the dollar store, go out to eat at a place like Oliver's, have fun, um, 
have recreation here together as a group. It was wonderful. We did a lot together with the recreation staff. They planned wonderful activities with the group uh, all together. It was great. And I know that you've been double vaccinated as I have with the Pfizer vaccine. And can I ask what made you get the vaccine, Joanne? Well, we heard so much about it on the news, first of all. Secondly, they recommended it here uh, at CARE 1 of Millbury. And thinking about it and having it recommended by CARE 1 of Millbury, we decided that that was the thing to do. We signed the papers and away we went. And did you experience any side effects from the vaccine shots at all? I experienced not one side effect at all. They uh, exper they told us we might experience all kind of side effects and nothing, and none of my friends here experienced any side effects either. It was a wonderful experience, made me feel good knowing that I got it. Great, yeah, me too, I agree with all that. I had COVID-19 myself and uh, it was an awful experience. I had that which started with pneumonia, which I thought was just a heavy cough. And the nurses checked me out, called the doctor and I was in the hospital for I don't know how long because COVID took away part of my memory with it. And it was an awful, awful experience to go through. I would never want anyone from my family or my circle of friends to have to go through that again. So that's one of the reasons you were vaccinated, and to protect everyone. That's absolutely. I want to be able to hug my sister and my daughter again and have fun with them, go out to, to eat, go out shopping, go out and have fun with my grandkids and my nieces and nephews and just have fun. Just, just remain hopeful that I will have a long life ahead of me. I'm young for being in care one of Millbury. I am young and I live with people who might be older but are very young spirit, spirited here in Millbury. And you do have a lot of family. You have a lot of family support and oh, you know it's they've, wonderful. they've really stood by this this whole shutdown and they've come in and they've made signs and they've sent you singing telegrams and they, they've really gone out of the way to show you how much they love you. Absolutely, the singing telegrams at Christmas was, were the best. They yeah. got them for so many people here. Uh, it, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. They, they love Care One, I think, as much as I do. I believe that. Millbury has never, will never be the same. It's a very special place that touched their hearts and care one is what touched their hearts. Well, that's good to know and good to hear. And the recreation staff has become part of my family. Every single one of them, they work hard, they, they do everything to make us happy, everything. Yeah. And what are your hopes post-vaccine? Post-vaccine, my hopes are to get back together as a group, the recreation staff, here at CARE One has been wonderful. When we couldn't get together as a group, they came to us individually in our rooms. I don't know what we would have done without them. They brought the group activities into us individually. We had arts, we had arts and crafts, we had um, all kind of activities, game, games, name, name words, I heard they did it. some cocktail carts for you. We have a cocktail cart now. Every Wednesday, we can get a car. We can get cocktails in. It's wonderful, and they have cheese, crackers, fruits, uh, all kind of stuff. It's great. It's great. They're wonderful. The recreation staff puts that out for us. Every day, they have something that they put out for us. Very nice. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I'm Christine Bennett, the administrator at Care One at Millbury, and I'm hoping to give you a perspective on skilled nursing centers during the pandemic and the safety measures in place today that make our centers a safe place to rehabilitate. We are so grateful to work with the Sheriff, Worcester County Sheriff's Office and the Central Mass Agency on Aging to provide this education to you. Skilled nursing centers began seeing cases in March and April of 2020. 
There was a new guidance that came out for mask wearing and use of personal protective equipment, also known as PPE. Some skilled nursing centers had difficulty obtaining the volume of PPE that they needed during that time. Employees that had any symptoms were not allowed to work. Testing was also very difficult at this time because tests were not widely available and results could take over a week to get back to us. The guidance from CDC and the Department of Public Health was ever-changing as new PPE wearing, cohorting of residents, and infection control rules were updated and regularly sent out to us. We saw many of our beloved staff and residents get sick. Some of them passed away. Many of us feel that we have still not, not had time to grieve this great loss. Our employees assisted families to arrange window visits, Skype, FaceTime, and phone calls to keep connected. Our recreation department worked tirelessly to keep our residents engaged and active. Skilled nursing centers were very organized to quickly respond to new cases during the second wave that hit us after the Thanksgiving holiday. This time there was ample supply of PPE and testing materials and we could get results back within 24 to 48 hours. We also had ongoing surveillance testing in order to help identify any possible asymptomatic patients or employees. Staff were very well trained on infection control protocols, PPE usage, screening and testing procedures. Housekeeping staff kept our centers well sanitized and paid extra attention to high touch services. We have seen that the community has been reluctant to seek the health care that they need in hospitals, skilled nursing centers, and physicians' offices due to fear of contracting COVID-19. Hopefully from listening today, you can hear the progress that has been made in skilled nursing centers. And one year later, COVID-19 has become something that we can manage in our centers now that we have the tools and experience to do so. We are seeing that those who come in for care are much more debilitated than what we saw before the pandemic. Many seniors have not had the opportunity to be active in their communities, to walk or to get exercise. We have also seen much more isolation in these individuals. We're also seeing a higher number of patients go straight home after being in the hospital, even when a rehab stay was recommended. Many of these patients are not faring well at home and have ended up needing to go back to the hospital or to admit directly to a rehab center for a short stay. Early in the pandemic, the government made it much easier for Medicare recipients to access the care that they need. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS, has waived the need for a three-night hospital stay or the 60-day period of wellness in order for recipients to access Medicare and skilled nursing centers. They have also allowed those that have exhausted their 100-day benefit to get an additional, additional days if they need them. If you find that you need skilled nursing care in the future, I hope that you will feel that you have a better understanding of the safety measures in place today that make our centers a safe place to rehabilitate. Please don't put off getting the help that you need. WTAG is proud to support Eldercare 2021. We both have a lot in common. WTAG and Eldercare 2021 are about empowering people with information and making them aware of all the resources available to make their life better. Thank you, Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging, for making Elder Care 2021 possible and inviting WTAG to be a part of it. If you are an elder or caregiver in Central Massachusetts looking for additional information about resources, visit the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging's website at seniorconnection.org and click on the Elder Care 2021 tab. You can also call 508 852 5539. Our next presentation features Polly Tatum, Esquire, who will be speaking on the topic of elder law. Hi everyone, my name is Attorney Polly Tatum and my practice is focused on seniors and what we do is we help protect what you have for the people that you love the most. And so I want to talk to you guys today about what's the difference between estate planning and elder law. And so with estate planning, your estate is the property that you leave behind after you transition, after you've passed away. And estate planning is making choices about what you want to happen to that property. So the traditional estate planning attorney focuses on wills and trusts, powers of attorney, and going through probate court. Now not all estate planning attorneys are elder law attorneys, or vice versa. And elder law is generally defined by the population served. So we're talking about aging or disabled persons who could be facing future health care issues. 
And what elder law attorneys focus on generally is Medicaid planning, veterans bene benefits, special needs planning, powers of attorney from a different perspective, and long-term care planning. And what our firm does is we blend both of these two areas to create an excellent plan that protects you and your family and your legacy. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about long-term care statistics and costs, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how I got into um, this area of law. So I have a grandmother. She lives in Bermuda. We affectionately call her Dorothy Louise, and she'll be 99 in uh, the end of June, so 99 June 2021. And one of the things about her is she's very vibrant. She still works, she drives her car, um, she's a hairdresser, and she always jokes that she has to pick up her elderly customers. And we, we're always telling her, well, Dee Dee, you're elderly. And one of the things that she's concerned about is losing her independence. And so one in four people will need some type of long-term care plan in the future. And this probability does increase with age. More than half the people who turn 65 today will require some type of long-term care, whether it's a nursing home or assisted living. And obviously women, like my grandmother, are more likely to require care and for a longer period of time since they generally live longer than men. And the cost of long-term care will be the greatest threat to your home and to your financial resources. So I'm going to talk about um, some numbers back to 2017 and the 2017 national averages. So if you have a home health um, aid that comes into your home, generally you're looking at spending about $20 an hour. And that can um, be a lot of money depending on how many hours a week or a day that you need for your loved ones. And then when we're talking about assisted living, you're looking at probably about $37.50 a month. And of course, that's 2017 numbers. It's a little more expensive than that. And then when we're looking at nursing home care, you're talking about $7,200 a month for a shared room and $8,200 a month for a private room. And those costs have risen on average about 3 to 4% annually for the past five years. And families are concerned about how they're going to pay for those expenses. So Medicare does not cover nursing home care, except for limited stays after a hospital admission of three days or more. So how will a family pay for this care? You're looking at using your monthly income. You're looking at using your savings. You're looking at, if you're fortunate to have long-term care insurance, and many people don't have that, using that policy. You're relying upon family members. You may possibly have to sell your home. Public benefits, benefits also will help to contribute to those um, costs. And then you're looking at implementing a legal plan to protect your home and savings. And that's where elder law attorney comes in place. And so you're looking at a combination of all of those things um, to help you pay for the cost of long-term care. And so Medicaid is a uh, public benefit program that provides medical assistance to low-income individuals, including those who are 65 years or older, disabled, or blind. And it is the single largest payer of nursing home bills in America. And there are strict income and asset rules to be able to utilize Medicaid. So generally speaking, a single person must have less than $2,000 in assets to qualify for Medicaid, so you have to be a sick in order to qualify to go into a long-term care facility, and B, you have to be broke, so you can't have more than $2,000 in assets. And then a married couple, it's less than approximately $120,000 in assets. And so when we're looking at Medicaid, we're looking at countable assets. And what are countable assets? And those include items such as your life insurance policies, your investment accounts, any CDs, any bank accounts. And then there are exempt assets, which include your home and your household goods, your automobiles, and any prepaid funeral contracts. And then there's a five-year look-back period. So it's not possible to give away all of your assets and immediately become eligible for Medicaid. So there are some planning techniques that can be utilized 
when you work with an elder law attorney. So I'm going to tell you the story about Dorothy and Ralph, and no, this is not my grandmother, Dorothy. So Dorothy and Ralph, they're ages 71 and 74, and Dorothy will be having hip replacement surgery soon, and a friend suggested that they visit an attorney to make sure that they have the appropriate documents in place, just in case Dorothy has some complications during recovery, or if Ralph should suddenly fall ill. So after visiting with an elder law attorney, Dorothy and Ralph now have a comprehensive powers of attorneys for both of them, health care and living wills. And with the attorney, they're working to develop a plan that protects their home and their hard-earned savings in the event that they need long-term care in the future. And what this does, this plan does, it ensures that they don't lose their home or their savings to the rising costs of long-term care. And so let's talk about Ellen and Tom. So Ellen is widowed. She lost her husband. She has a very small savings and a monthly income. Plus, she has her home, which does not have a mortgage. So about two years ago, she transferred her home. She deeded her home over to her son, Tom. And this was done so they thought he could have a home without having to go through probate court once she passed away. Well, Alan recently became ill, and now she's in a nursing home. And Tom, he's unable to afford the cost of her care, and her assets are almost gone. So the question um, that a lot of seniors have is, will Alan be eligible for Medicaid? Will Medicaid pay for the cost of her care? Now remember, Ellen is single, she's widowed, and she has more than $2,000 in assets. Is the transfer of the home an issue? Well, remember, there's a five-year look-back period, and Ellen transferred the home to her son, Tom, two years ago. So what should Tom do? And that's where you look at seeking the advice of an elder law attorney, because the role of the attorney goes well be beyond Simple provi simply providing legal advice for the family. We, we are consistently acting as the family counselor because clients are concerned about losing independence, they're concerned about having a caregiver, they're concerned about their, finan their finances. And what we provide, we're a conduit, we're a resource center for our, for our clients and helping them set up a comprehensive plan. So what are some of our goals? Well, like my grandmother Dorothy, we want our clients to age with dignity. We want to provide you with comprehensive options so that you and your family can make informed decisions. We want to identify who's going to care for you and who's going to help you manage your assets. And we want to place you in charge of your future. Because you've worked hard for what you have, and we want you to be able to leave a legacy for your loved ones. So that's my presentation for today. For today. A couple of questions that come up for um, our clients, um, especially those who are single, is what's going to happen to our pets? And so I wanted to address that today because people don't think about that often until something significant happens. And one of the things that um, is really a fun thing to do for your pets is to do a pet trust. Leave a pet trust, leave someone in charge, leave a set amount of money so that that person will be able to take care of, uh, of your pets when you no longer can. So if you're interested in learning more, um, feel free to schedule your strategy session with us today. Uh, that's my website, Kathy's my assistant. You can certainly give us a call and we'd be more than happy to meet with you and your family to help you plan for your future. Thank you. Next, we will have a presentation on mental health and well-being for seniors by Jeff Kushner, a licensed mental health expert. I'm Jeff Kushner, and I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker here in Massachusetts. I've worked with a number of people who have been challenged by the conditions of this pandemic. I manage a group mental health practice that works with individuals and families addressing mental health challenges. During the past year, we've used telehealth only, uh, which is secure video sessions, as done in the me medical field. We found great success even from across the screen in working with those in need and helping people make gains even in this unique time. Depression and anxiety are common for people age 60 and over. Uh, as a matter of fact, 
According to the CDC, 7 million people 65 years and old uh, and older have depression each year, and suicide is the cause of death in one in six people aged 65 years uh, of age and older. We know one in four people are dealing with anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges in all of society. We know depression, also known as major depressive disorder, is caused by difficult experiences that we live through, as well as our genetics. This is also true of anxiety, also known by the clinical term generalized anxiety disorder. Therapy, and sometimes also medication, are the usual treatment for both of these. There was also a study by the American Psychological Association that found 49% of adults reported feeling uneasy about returning to in-person interactions when the coronavirus pandemic eventually ends. For seniors trying to manage multiple responsibilities, like raising grandchildren who've been primarily homeschooled, the stress has increased even more uh, than usual during, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic by these challenges. So over the past year, there's a number of risk factors for seniors. Uh, I hear from seniors uh, that their social circles have decreased a lot over the years, especially those whose family have moved away, as well as partners and friends that are no longer around. For some, their friends moved due to retirement or to facilities to maintain their health and safety. Now they find themselves more isolated than ever. Over the past year, the coronavirus pandemic raged on, and they're dealing with chronic loneliness on top of the fear of contracting a deadly disease. On top of all this, seniors are the biggest target group most at risk of COVID-19, and many are aware of this. The effects of loneliness are mental and physical. Feeling lonely and isolated may make you move around less and not eat as frequently or as much as you should, which leads to decreased quality of life and physical health, which can make you depressed, which leads to moving around and eating less. It's a cycle that risks the quality of life and health of those who appear to be strong enough to manage this challenging time. The isolation, fear, and trauma, trying to ensure we remain healthy and free of COVID-19 is truly an issue we need to address. For even active seniors, they attended events and meals at senior centers and have been visiting family regularly. And now suddenly, that has been all shut down over the past year. The symptoms of depression vary from person to person. In seniors, some of the most common symptoms include feeling sadness or emptiness, feeling helpless, cranky, nervous, or guilty for no reason, sudden lack of enjoyment in favorite pastimes that we once enjoyed, fatigue, loss of energy, loss of concentration, uh, loss of memory, um, either sleeping too little or too much, uh, eating too much or too little, uh, you know, thoughts of, of, of killing ourselves or attempt to do so, aches and pains, headaches, abdominal cramps, and digestive issues that we didn't have prior to the pandemic occurring. So the symptoms of anxiety are, include sleeping pattern changes, changes in weight, appetite or eating, chest pain, digestive problems, dizziness, lightheadedness, shakiness or nausea, eye or vision problems, fatigue. Uh, we can forget uh, things that we used to remember or we're confused more than usual, headaches, um, we're more irritable and cranky, or we're, we have these panic symptoms uh, on issues that we never had before, um, which can be very scary. Muscle weakness, tension or soreness, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, and also um, substance abuse, like drinking more alcoholic beverages than, than usual. Um, you know, and coping with this loneliness that, that it, it just seemed uh, to continue. So as the pandemic continues and afterwards, there are some ways people 60 and older can help themselves. Video calls are a great way to stay connected over this time, but some seniors aren't so confident using websites like Zoom or uh, talking on the phone through using FaceTime, for example. The main focus is staying connected to others, especially those you wanna see as more people get vaccinated and we get the go ahead to resume our normal activities soon. Uh, the main piece is don't be afraid to ask for help. Our local senior centers and local area agencies on aging, like Elder Services of Worcester, Montachusett Healthcare Corporation, and Tri-Valley Elder Services are there for us in our part of Massachusetts. They still operate a number of great programs to support seniors at home and support uh, telephone, use telephone support for just to have a friendly voice on the other side of that phone if that's needed. So at home, 
there's a few ways we can stay emotionally and mentally sharp. We can recreate our pre-pandemic activities. Lots of, there's lots of online content and games that can be seen on the computer for those who are computer savvy. We can also reach out by phone to family and friends. We can even just watch television with another person who's on the other side of the video call or telephone. To stay busy, coloring can be really great. Listening to music, looking at old pictures and recipes can also help. It's also important to stay active around the house, which prepares us to resume to our normal again when we get that official notification we're all waiting for. We can still go outside and breathe in the air and stay six feet apart while visiting others, especially now that it's getting warmer. Staying connected is really a big contributor to our mental and emotional resilience. And it's also important to focus on our wellness, which includes eating well, good nutrition, you know, good patterns of regular sleeping, uh, routines that we need to do to keep ourselves up, like bathing and brushing our teeth regularly. We need to keep ourselves up because we're gonna be on the other side of this pandemic soon. I also like mindfulness, where we take up to three deep breaths to calm ourselves and our body. We have these increased feelings of depression and anxiety. We've made it this far. Many of us are vaccinated or scheduled to do so, and it's time we plan to get ourselves back to our old selves. Thank you for listening, and I hope this has been helpful for you, and I wish you the best in listening to the rest of the information at the Elder Care event this year. If you are an elder or caregiver in Central Massachusetts looking for additional information about resources, visit the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging's website at SeniorConnection.org and click on the Elder Care 2021 tab. You can also call 508-852-5539. Our final piece will be a PSA from the Worcester Community Action Council about their fuel assistance program. Take a look. Need help keeping your home warm this winter? Massachusetts winters are brutal and many families have trouble paying home heating expenses. But our Home Energy Assistance Program helps pay fuel bills and offers utility discounts, as well as energy efficient measures and equipment. No matter what heat source you use, whether you rent or own your home, we can help you keep warm, safe, and healthy all winter. Learn more and see if you qualify. Visit heatinghelpma.org today. Well, thank you everyone for watching Elder Care 2021. We hope that you found this virtual program informative and want you to know that we're here to support you every step of the way. If you or anyone you know needs assistance, please reach out to the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging or the Worcester County Sheriff's Office for additional support. Thank you to those who participated in the presentations as well as those that have supported our local efforts to provide more information and resources to our older adults here in Central Massachusetts. On behalf of the entire staff at the Central Massachusetts Agency on Aging and our Board of Directors, we say thank you, be well, and be safe, and we look forward to seeing you in person in the future. Thank you. <laughs>